Hey, thanks so much. It's really an honor to be here with all of you at this absolutely amazing university. And, and Jerry, thanks for that introduction. I, I, I really appreciate it. I have a long history with Liberty. I used to actually come down here to spend time with Jerry's dad, Reverend Falwell. And uh, in fact, we found a clip of that video, but I'd like to show you a little bit of it right now, if we can. We'll get into why a Baptist preacher would be a member of the NRA, but I joined the NRA just as a regular member. But yesterday, I Federal Express to your office the lifetime membership check. Now, it probably hadn't cleared the bank yet. Actually, Dr. Falwell, we have the check, and uh, I brought with me your credentials, your new life member credentials, uh, along with your certificate of membership. I, I roll that camera right here. Right, this, this is my lifetime membership. So if you hear Alan Dershowitz or someone accuse me of being a lifetime member of the NRA, they're right. This is the card, and I'll put it in my billfold after we go off the air. Go you'll ahead. Be, you'll be joining uh, President Teddy Roosevelt, and Ronald Reagan, and Charlton Heston, and General Joe Foss, and a lot of other Americans. And I'm going to, Wayne, thank you for this. I'm going to put this on my office right beside my ordination certificate, and I'm going to tell everybody in a few moments why I believe it is so important. Let's put this back down here if we could. And thank you so much for doing it. To me, it is not a gun issue. I don't have time to hunt. Mm -hmm. In my lifetime, to my knowledge, I have never knowingly hurt anybody, and I pray I'll be able to say that just after I get to heaven, that I never have hurt anybody. But I have said from my pulpit that I believe every American under the Second Amendment has the right to bear arms, and if someone broke into my home to hurt my wife, my children, my grandchildren, I would plug them right here without praying about it. And I would hope that every daddy, granddaddy listening out there would take the scripture seriously, which says if a man will not care for or protect his own household, he is worse than an infidel. Yeah, he was. You know, what a lot of you may not know, and, and I know you know, Jerry, is Reverend Falwell had an amazing sense of humor. I remember being down here with him on one of those trips, and we were driving down the road and in, a, in, a, in his SUV, and all of a sudden he swerved in the other lane, and there was another SUV coming straight at us. And just before we got close together, he swerved back in the other lane, and Reverend Falwell broke out in a big laugh and said, that was one of my football players. I just wanted to see if he was awake. And I'm like, well, you sure woke me up by doing that. So being here today really does bring a lot of memories back to me. And, we're all blessed by Reverend Falwell, this great university, President Falwell, what you all have done with liberty. It is truly a gem in the United States of America that we as Americans should all be proud of. And our country is a lot better off for it. I wonder, uh, and I think I know the answer, some NRA members out here in the audience today? Yeah. Thank you. Everything NRA accomplishes is people one by one all over the country. That's what makes it happen. And I really do appreciate all that support and all you do for the Second Amendment for our country and our freedom, because the media always forgets it's just in people's hearts. We do it together. They make it sound like we're not the majority. We're the majority in this country, overwhelmingly. Now let me ask you another question. How many of you own firearms or believe in that great freedom to keep and bear arms? Thanks for standing up and exercising your real and personal liberty that's bestowed upon all of us by our Creator. Now, I'm not going to ask you to identify yourself here today, but I know that many of you are probably carrying a concealed firearm for personal protection. And you're, the reason you're doing that is because the leadership of this university respects and encourages your Second Amendment rights. And here's the deal. Because so many of you have committed to the training and the responsibility of carrying a firearm, and because you have rejected that dangerous lie of gun-free zones, I'm standing right now in one of the safest places in the country.
You know, the hard facts are we can't predict where evil may strike. The next campus, the next church, the next shopping mall, or airport. We do know evil will eventually strike again. And if, God forbid, a monster should walk onto this campus, that evil will be met with the one indisputable fact of liberty, that the surest way to stop a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. Of course, there are some that don't agree with that. In fact, you and your university have been criticized for allowing students, faculty, and staff to carry concealed firearms. Well, I've been leading the NRA for almost 25 years now, and gun owners have been criticized and demonized by the media and those same political elites for as long as I can remember. They call us paranoid for arming ourselves for protection. They dismiss us as gun nuts. They blame us for a tragedy that has nothing at all to do with lawful gun ownership, and they scorn us, they scorn us all, for standing up for our rights. You know, we face a culture of leadership in this country that routinely lies on all kinds of fronts. I mean, think about it. Brian Williams, you can keep your health care. The border's more safe than ever. Benghazi. We face an epidemic of untruth at the highest levels of our country. The American public all over this country, citizens just like you, sit out there and says, say, oh my gosh, it's got to stop. And yet when someone does tell the truth, they get clobbered. It's like it's all upside down. Lies seem normal. The truth seems bizarre, like it's crazy talk. And the news media doesn't want to tell us what the news is. They want to tell you what to think. All of that is having a devastating impact on the kind of values, freedoms, and beliefs that our country was founded on. When you catch them in a lie, let me show you what you can do if you stand up to them. Please watch this video. Now we give you the other side from the executive vice president of the National Rifle Association, Wayne LaPierre. Wayne, thanks for being with us. Hi, Kara. Good to be with you. Well, if the ban on assault weapons expires, what kind of weapons would be legal? Kara, let me say this at the start. I'm glad you ran that story because apparently the only difference between the New York Times and CNN is that when a reporter for the New York Times fakes a story, he's fired, and at CNN, he's not. Your bureau chief, John Zarella, deliberately faked the story yesterday intending to show that the performance characteristics of banned firearms on the list are somehow different from the performance characteristics of firearms not on the banned list. He was, a, he was implying that these were uh, machine guns or fully automatic guns. That's not true. Mr. LaPierre, I, I have to stop you there. No one fakes stories at, he, at CNN, and John Zarella definitely did not fake a story at CNN. Here. You're very off base. I'm going to let you say your opinion, and let's right, have well, a conversation, let, but don't accuse uh, our reporter of faking well, any no, story, sir. Let me say it again in front of the whole country. Your reporter faked that story yesterday. It deliberately misread right, the gonna, viewer. There's no, way, there's no way it could be true, and I we're, challenge we're, CNN to defend it. Yeah, yeah. Here's the thing. CNN finally admitted I was right and ran a correction. But millions of viewers were deceived. And the really sad thing about that is this. If I hadn't happened to be sitting in the studio and caught him red-handed like a bank robber running out of the bank with a bag of dye exploding all over him, that lie would have continued to stand as truth. It's got to the point in this country where one of America's greatest vulnerabilities is the failure of the media to provide a level playing field for the truth. And it's up to all of us to hold their feet to the fire. It's up to all of you to call them out for their lies. And when you see them doing it, stand up to them. Get right in their face. Do something about it, because it can make a difference. So many of those elites, they think they're better than us. They somehow think they're more sophisticated. They think, they think they're more intellectually evolved somehow than we are. Or they think they're just somehow plain smarter than we are. 
Well, I've got news for the elites who look down their noses at all of us and our rights. We gun owners are a heck of a lot smarter than you'll ever be. And it's true. In all of history, there's never been a group of citizens so engaged, so determined, so resolute, and so unified in defending freedom, so politically savvy and individually prepared and responsible for protecting our families and our communities. Never have there been there smarter, freer American citizens than America's 100 million gun owners. And let me say that again. In all of the world, some of the smartest citizens are American gun owners. And let me tell you why. Gun owners, law-abiding gun owners, are smart enough to know that when that evil monster comes, our survival is right there in our own hands. Gun owners are smart enough to know that government can't protect us. At the scene of the crime, and I know all of you know this, if you think about it, it's always the criminal and the victim. Despite everyone else's good intentions, they always come in later. You're there alone. Gun owners are smart enough to know that we, all of us, individually, are the first line of defense. And we're smart enough to know that the elites are lying when they try to tell you that one more gun control law is going to keep you safe. You want proof? Let's talk about Chicago. For the gun control crowd, Chicago is utopia. I mean, after all, they've tried every type of gun law they can think of in that town, from licensing to registration to gun bans. Their utopian dream is Chicago's nightmare. Already this year, 400 people have been shot in Chicago. Compared to a year ago, the homicide rate in Chicago has skyrocketed by 100 percent. Think about it, 100 percent. Does anybody think that sounds like success? As you know, Chicago is President Obama's hometown. In January, he participated in a so-called town hall meeting. In that town hall meeting, he denigrated law-abiding gun owners. He attacked the National Rifle Association, and he attempted to advance his own political agenda, and he called out the NRA. He implied that somehow we were afraid to meet him. He, as he said, hey, you guys are just down the street. Well, let me repeat right now what I said then. And I said again at the CPAC conference two weeks ago, and I'll be real crystal clear about it. Mr. President, if you want to debate over our Second Amendment freedom, if you want to turn this election into a bare-knuckled brawl over the rights of law-abiding gun owners all over this country, I challenge you to a one-hour debate with a mutually agreed-upon monitor on any network that will take it, no pre-screen questions, no gas bag answers. Mr. President, if you want that debate, bring it on. We're just down the street. What are you afraid of, Mr. President? You know, but there's been no response from the White House. The President keeps ducking me. And gun owners are smart enough to know, and I think you know it as you sit there today, and he's never going to debate me on guns. Gun owners know the President, if he debated me, would get his clock clean. And the President knows that, too. He also knows, and this is really important, he also knows he could pick up the phone and he could order his United States attorneys to flip Chicago upside down and prosecute every felon with a gun, every criminal gang member with a gun, and every drug dealer with a gun. If he did that, that would make Chicago safer. And until the president does that, Chicago is his failure. Chicago is his lasting legacy of rampant violence that he could, but he refuses to stop. Worse, Chicago's just the tip of the iceberg of Obama's failure. 
Let me tell you a story. It goes back to the 90s. I was sitting in my office one day in the late 90s. Richmond, Virginia had become the third most violent city of the country at that time. And this young prosecutor called me up and he said, Wayne, we don't know each other, but I've been reading your speeches. And I'm going to give you a chance to put your money where your mouth is. He said, I'm going to do what nobody's ever done in this town. He said, I'm going to put the federal gun laws on a card, federal gun laws, existing federal gun laws. I still have one of the cards right here in my hand. And he said, I'm going to go into the police department, I'm going to tell them this. Every time they see a drug dealer with a gun, a criminal gang member with a gun, a felon with a gun, I'm going to tell them to call my office and we are going to prosecute them 100 percent of the time. We're not going to put them out on bail and we are going to take them off the streets. He went to the African-American community, the business community. He went to gun owners. He got everybody behind that program. He went into African-American churches and talked to the moms and said, I want to make your kids safe. Stop the killing. And you know what he did? He cut murder by that town in 60 percent, by 60 percent. He, he did it. He did it. And he told me this story. He said, Wayne, I was sitting at home one night and there was another murder on TV. And my little girl looked at me and said, Daddy, can't somebody stop that? And he thought to himself, I'm the somebody. And he did something about it. And it worked. The program was so successful. You know what happened next? The Clinton administration squashed it. The prosecutor's career came to a halt. The Obama administration, they won't even discuss it. And Obama's former attorney general, Eric Holder, called it a cookie-cutter approach to solving crime and dismissed it outright. Nobody's done it since in this country. Now in Hampton Roads, Virginia. Yeah, but here's the sad thing. Thousands of convicted felons have been caught with illegal guns, and most of them have never been punished. And just so you know, a convicted felon is prohibited from even touching a firearm. If he does or she does, the penalty is up to 10 years in federal prison. Same with criminal gang members. If you're caught dealing drugs and you have a gun and you're out on the street ruining neighborhoods, it's up to 15 years in federal prison. In Hampton Roads, however, eight out of 10 felons found guilty of that don't spend a one single day in jail. They're back on the streets. They're free to murder. They're free to rob. And they're free to ruin those neighborhoods. And here's the crazy part. The political elites, the national news media, the media celebrities accuse us, law-abiding gun owners, of being unreasonable. Let me tell you what's unreasonable. Letting bad guys go. Letting repeat offenders, violent offenders with guns continue to ravage our streets and our neighborhoods in this country. If you want reason, you want smarts, then try it our way. Enforce the laws on the books. Clean up Chicago. Clean up Hampton Roads. Clean up Washington, D.C., Los Angeles, St. Louis, and all the other crime zones in this country. And do it by arresting them, prosecuting them, and sending them to prison, and that's what works. That, that will keep innocent citizens safe, and every law-abiding gun owner in America knows it. And you know who else knows it? Every rank-and-file police officer that's out walking those streets. They all know it, that that's the answer, and they pray every day that our elected officials will only do it and start making this country safe. But sadly, the political debate in this country, it isn't about keeping people safer. It's all about banning guns, your guns. That's all the elites want to talk about because that's all they really care about. It has nothing to do with making the country safer. Remember that story that President Obama talks about, he tells it all the time, of that poor 16-year-old girl that came to his inauguration 
and went back to Chicago, and she was killed by a criminal gang member back in Chicago? I'm sure you've heard it. He's told it, tells it all the time. What he doesn't tell you, and what the media is dishonest enough in this country not to report, is that criminal gang member that killed that poor 16-year-old girl was, should never have been out on the streets to begin with. He was convicted of gun charges. He was released on probation, put on the streets. He was picked up for numerous times while he was on the streets and was never taken off the streets. And he ended up killing that poor 16-year-old girl. No federal gun charges were ever brought from the Obama administration before that happened. It's a tragedy. It shouldn't have happened. Yet it happens in Chicago over and over and over again. I have really come to believe the president cares more about the story than he does about stopping it. And that's a really sad commentary in our country about our political leadership. Gun owners are smart enough to know that the president also cares more about restricting your freedom. He cares more than he cares about enforcing the existing federal gun laws and keeping people safe. And people all over this country have had enough of that kind of president. There's an election coming up, and we're smart enough and we're fired enough, up enough to do something about it. Our nation is going to be put back on its rightful course, where individual freedom is respected, where justice is restored, where laws are enforced, and government gets off our backs and leaves us the heck alone. It really comes down to this. If we could legislate evil out of people's hearts, we would have done it long ago. I used to do a television show, a radio show on Westwood One every Sunday night. And one of the guests used to be John Douglas. He was one of the top FBI profilers in this country. And I always remember something he said to me on that show. He said, Wayne, if I learned one thing in my career, it's that some people are just pure evil. Pure evil. And you heard Julia tell the story, descended on Brussels yesterday. Thank God her parents are okay. Our hearts and prayers go out to the Belgian people and the victims of that terror attack, including the families of innocent Americans who were there. If evil, if evil ever descends on your house at 2 a.m. at night and the glass breaks, there's not a government and there is not an authority on the planet that substitutes for your individual right to own a firearm to protect yourself. I remember after Katrina in New Orleans, we had people, it was chaos in that city, and we had camera crews down there asking people, were they okay, were, what, how they felt. And I remember we filmed this one African-American woman sitting on her porch, and the camera, the, the interviewer went up to her and said, are you scared? Because it was chaos everywhere. And she looked at him and she said, no, I have everything I need. I have my Bible and I have my gun. You know? All over this country, no one cares more about protecting themselves than women. 30 million American women now own firearms. That number is growing every single day. And the number one women, number one reason women give for owning a firearm is personal protection. Soccer moms have increasingly become safety moms, and they found a home in the National Rifle Association. Please watch. I'm a mom. And just like millions of other women, that's why I own guns. We're responsible, we're law-abiding, and we're everything that makes America strong. Every day, we're willing to use a firearm to defend our families. But the media will never tell those stories. If a mom puts a gun to the face of a home-invading thug and makes him run for his life, the story gets buried. But if she's unarmed and murdered, the cameras will be at the scene before the police. It's time for moms like me to speak out. We are the majority.
We demand the freedom to defend our families, and we challenge the media to tell the truth about our rights. I'm the National Rifle Association of America, and I'm freedom's safest place. Yeah, I see a lot of young women out here today. I'll say this, no woman should ever, and I mean ever, have to face evil with empty hands. American women who own firearms know that you aren't free if you aren't free to defend yourself. Gun owners are smart enough to know that if Hillary Rodham Clinton would deny women that right, then she really doesn't care about women at all, not one bit. And, and you know what really gets me is the hypocrisy of it all. While Hillary would deny women and men their Second Amendment rights and freedoms, she's surrounded by armed security and has been surrounded by armed security for most of her life. Hillary Clinton is just like a lot of other media elites and media celebrities and anti-gun politicians. They don't hate guns, they just hate our guns. Everything they care about, they surround with armed security. So every time Hillary Clinton attacks our Second Amendment freedom, gun owners are smart enough to say, hey, Hillary, you go first. You give up your protection if you want. But I am never going to surrender my individual right to own a firearm to protect myself. You can count on that. <laughs> Hillary hadn't found a gun control law she didn't like. It goes from national registration to licensing to bans, you name it. And if Hillary survives her primary, I'm talking about the real one, her FBI primary. Yeah. That's, that's the real one. But if she does, she'll come after law-abiding gun owners with every onerous restriction and anti-gun Supreme Court nominee that she can appoint, all aimed at destroying our great individual Second Amendment freedom in this country. Hillary would wipe that away faster than she'd wipe away her server. Yeah. And gun owners and Americans are smart enough to know that. And I'll tell you what else. We're all smart enough to go to the polls and defeat her. We know, and all of you know, that freedom comes from the ability to protect ourselves that we're individually empowered to take charge of our own security. Gun owners know that America, this amazing country, is the greatest, freest nation on Earth. We're not confined by our own vulnerability, like citizens of the rest of the world, who have only their governments to rely on. Gun owners know that the only truly free people that have ever lived have been armed people, capable of defending themselves and their families. Gun owners are smart enough to know that all other freedoms lay behind the one essential freedom, the Second Amendment, that guarantees all the rest. And gun owners are smart enough to know the difference between Supreme Court justices who respect the Constitution and liberal appointees that if they stacked that court would rewrite the Bill of Rights, destroy our freedom for the rest of our lifetimes. And gun owners are smart enough to know that standing up for liberty and fighting for freedom is essential to saving our nation. Please watch this. The only truly free people who have ever walked this earth have been armed people capable of defending themselves and their families. Americans look in horror at supposedly free countries all over the world where innocent people live or die at the mercy of their government. 
We see what it's like to be French, German, or Belgian, where innocent people cower in fear as evil closes in, utterly aware of their own vulnerability, doomed to defend their families with rolling pins and broom handles. Let the rest of the world choose to live in fear. That false brand of freedom will never be ours. We are free to be as armed, trained, and prepared as we see fit. And we will never surrender that freedom to the global gun ban order. I'm the National Rifle Association of America, and I'm freedom's safest place. Our Second Amendment freedom empowers each of you, all of us, to a freer life. Gun owners cherish that freedom and are smart enough to know that we must never let it be taken from us. That freedom separates us from every other nation on Earth. It makes us stronger than other countries. It makes us better than other countries. That freedom makes us Americans. I was born in Greece in 1939. Nazi war planes bombed us unmercifully. Executions in the streets were common. I saw horror you could never imagine. Human beings became animals, starving and desperate. But me, I was lucky. Soon after the war, I saw the Statue of Liberty, and I cried. I've been blessed by the freedom and opportunity only America can offer. Today, I feel a duty to speak out. There will always be evil in this world, but the one thing that separates America from every other country is our freedom. And the one freedom that protects all the others is our Second Amendment. Never give it up. Never. I am the National Rifle Association of America, and I am freedom's safest place. Let me leave you with this. There's something very special about our country. There's a reason America is the envy of the world. Ours is the opportunity that can only come with that freedom. It is that freedom that's guaranteed by the Second Amendment, that freedom which the NRA stands and fights for. And when it comes to defending freedom, I'm proud of the fact no one fights harder, longer, or smarter than we do. Gun owners are smart enough to know that our freedom is at stake in this upcoming November election. And we're smart enough to know that we can and we will make the difference. We're smart enough to know that it will take all of us, every one of us, as Americans to do it. And it will take every one of you. Together, we are smart enough, capable enough, and absolutely determined enough to defend our liberty. Win back the White House, take back our country, and we're going to do it in November. And don't ever forget this. Keep getting up every morning and fighting for freedom every day. And thank you for inviting me. It's great to be with all you at Liberty University. Thank you very much.